hematologist with a special interest in thrombosis and hemostasis. I know that some of you have been sitting here for quite a while. Just to remind you that um, when you sit for more than 90 minutes, the blood flow through your popliteal vein falls by about 50%. So can I ask you just to wiggle around, move your calves, please. I don't want to be responsible for your deep vein thrombosis from sitting. Uh, oh, I've got some slides, lovely. So I was talk, asked to talk about a simple guide to coagulopathies. It's an oxymoron. Uh, there is no simplicity about the coagulopathies. And it, I have been thinking about it for a while. And I did prepare some very nice slides. And then when I came over my uh, laptop, as it came out of the tunnel uh, from uh, the channel into France, it got very hot and it smoked and it died on me and I lost the slides. So what I have got here is a second set of slides that I have prepared over the last 48 hours. So some of them are a little crude, but um, hopefully they'll explain themselves. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I don't take any money from pharma. Okay, so we'll start, we're going to be basic and you can ask questions, I don't mind what you ask about. Um, and if you want to stop me, do, because it's an opportunity to get things clear in your head. And it is the end of a very long day. I already have intellectual indigestion from the last few days and, and you must too. Anyway, so what is a coagulopathy? Um, it's a condition in which the blood's ability to clot is impaired. <coughs> and we know hemostasis is highly complex and that we can have a condition where we will have a tendency to bleeding and we can also have a tendency to thrombosis. And the classic one is disseminated intravascular coagulation. We should whenever we look at coagulation, make a clinical pathological diagnosis, by which I mean you go and see the patient and you look at their blood results. Because many times you can have very similar uh, changes uh, with standard tests, uh, but a different diagnosis. And of course, you take a history uh, and examine the patient and our tools are a full blood count and a film and a coagulation screen. But before we hit those, we also need to remember how important the hematocrit is in any coagulation. Uh, and anemia really matters. Um, why does it matter? Well, if we look, this is the PFA 100, you're forcing blood through a small hole that's coated with substances and the clotting stops uh, and we measure the time to the clot stopping. We know that if your platelet count falls, you will have a prolongation of this time. You'll have a prolongation of your bleeding time. If I make a hole in you and dab it and time how long it takes uh, for the hole to stop bleeding, it will be longer with a low platelet count. Not actually until you get to a platelet count of 80. So everything above 80 is fine. God gave us all too many platelets. We can manage on much less. But when we do the same thing, the same testing with increasingly anemic or diluted down um, for blood, we get a noticeable change. We are affected by the hematocrit. And we are affected by the hematocrit in two ways. So the first one is in your arteries, all of your blood is doing axial flow. And what axial flow means is the red cells are in the middle. So I've put the top here and out towards the edges, the plasma and the platelets will be in contact with the endothelium. And once you drop your hematocrit down by till it gets about 25, 27%, you lose axial flow. 
So the red cells are mixed in with the platelets and the plasma. So when you cut yourself, so you make a hole in the endothelium, it will just take longer for the platelets and the plasma that needs to get there to get there because the red cells get in the way. So because we lose axial flow when patients are quite anemic. And this is probably the main mechanism of increased bleeding time in patients who've got renal disease. So those patients on hemodialysis, they will always bleed longer because they tend to be anemic. Uh, and when we push up the hemoglobin with EPO, uh, we improve their bleeding time. Uh, and so anemia is important. And just to remind you that anemia is common in septic patients. We have anemia of chronic disease. We've got reduced production uh, and the cells aren't quite so good. And there's a blunted response to erythropoietin. All the cytokines of sepsis will limit the effect of uh, erythropoietin. And of course, if you get a DIC, you're getting hemolysis over the strands of, of the fibrin. So let's move on to a general approach. So uh, this, uh, I did a long time ago now, it's in the New England Journal. And what we're going to do is just go through it section by section. And if we think first about two areas to exclude, I'm excluding anyone who's got a congenital problem, so a haemophilia, or someone with a congenital thrombocytopenia, and people who are on anticoagulants. Uh, we talked about those earlier in the day. So let's have a look. So we've got bleeding can occur generally uh, and locally, and we have got those who've just got an isolated low platelet count. Uh, then we've got those who've got a low platelet count, no problem with clotting, but they've got fragmented cells. And then we're moving on. We've got either normal platelets or low platelets associated with coagulation abnormalities. So if we look at thrombocytopenia on the left, we have got lack of production, or the platelets are being destroyed, or uh, the platelets are sitting in a giant spleen. We don't have many giant spleens anymore. Uh, we, I did have a, a boy of 18 who had a giant spleen a couple of weeks ago uh, for various, he had portal hypertension, and it was starting con to consume his red cells, white cells, uh, and platelets at a phenomenal rate. But we don't see that hypersplenism very often because patients tend to get treated. Uh, if we look in hospitals, the commonest cause of thrombocytopenia is lack of production because we poison our patients with cytotoxic drugs uh, or we might give them um, a drug that they've got a, a reaction to. Out in the community, we would see uh, a lot of people who have a low platelet count because they develop an antibody to the platelets very transiently after viral infections, particularly after Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and occasionally, we have patients with immune thrombocytopenia. Uh, and really, that's hematology bread and butter. So uh, when we look at thrombocytopenia in critical care, I did touch on this this morning, terribly common. Uh, it's usually multifactorial. Uh, and those patients have a uh, less good survival because it's an indication of, of sickness, really. Um, and we, we need an approach. And for me, there are two things I just want to make absolutely sure those patients haven't got. And the number one is HIT, and the number two is a deficiency of adamant 13 uh, or um, uh, an HUS. Uh, and 
so we would be looking for those two things. We can also think about the fact that there are other causes in critical care. There's the huge list. Uh, of course, in any patient, when you take blood, you can get a pseudothrombocytopenia because there are uh, EDTA antibodies and the platelets clump together. And what would normally happen in anybody with a new thrombocytopenia, your laboratory hematology would do a film and have a look to see if there's any platelet clump clumping uh, and then ask you to take another sample, probably in a citrate tube, one of the blue-topped coagulation tubes because it's got a different anticoagulant and we get a more real platelet count. Um, as I was discussing this morning, if you've got high platelet turnover, so you've got ITP, you're sick with sepsis, you will have a lot of young platelets and the young platelets are being pushed out of the marrow pretty fast. Occasionally, you might see on the film what we call a reticulated platelet. It's not quite very mature and it's got slightly irregular edge to it. Um, and it hasn't quite extruded its nucleus. But the thing about some of the platelets that, is, that are young is they are large. They are the same size as the red cells. And when you look and you do a full blood count, you're measuring the cells by size. So in somebody with high platelet turnover, they might have on the machine a platelet count of 50, but in actual fact, if you do a film, you'll find there are many more platelets there because the large ones are being counted as red cells. Um, and we have a trick in hematology. In some centres, we would do an immunoplatelet count and we will measure platelets uh, in a different way using flow cytometry with an antibody to one of their antigens and get a true platelet count. Things are changing fast in haematology labs. So uh, in the average haematology lab, when you ask for a film, some poor, poor Emma Lay or scientist, and sometimes the haematology junior doctor and the consultant will sit down and actually look at the film and actually count the cells and tell you about the morphology. And what is coming through is a, a digital approach using AI so that you can take a picture of your film and AI will tell you what is there. And that will be the next major change in haematology over the next five years. I'm, I'm straying somewhat from my subject. Bring me back. So heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and uh, thrombosis. So this is when the heparin, after it's usually seven days, has uh, somehow linked with platelet factor four, which is something that comes out of platelets uh, when they're activated and formed a new antigen. And individuals make antibodies, that combination of heparin and platelet factor four. And those antibodies will bind to platelets and activate them, bind to endothelium and activate them. And so that we get a lot of platelet clumping, which can cause spontaneous thrombosis. And we all fear this, don't we? So we are always looking out for it. Uh, and we have the 4T score. And I think the important thing about the 4T score is it, it reminds us that it's not a big fall in platelet count that we see with um, HIT. It's at least a 30% uh, fall. You rarely see the platelet count down less than 50. If you're seeing it less than 50, there's either something else going on to make a thrombocytopenia or it's got missed early on. So you can pick it up very quickly. You could do the 4T score. It's really down to timing. So you've got to have that period of time of heparin to generate the antibody and then to see that fall. Or you may be prompted to think about it because you've got a fresh thrombosis. 
Uh, fresh thrombosis with HIT, not the best outcome. Uh, they have about a 20 or 30 percent mortality. Uh, and if you had that, I, I'd phone up my haematologist and talk to them because quite often we'd give intravenous gamma globulin and worst case scenario, uh, we would plasma exchange them. But what we tend to do is to stop the heparin and switch over to one of the non-heparin drugs, Argatroban, Fondaparanox, uh, and there are other drugs licensed in this area. So we're moving on to the second column, which is those who've got low platelet count and they've got fragmented cells in in the in the blood, but they have a normal coagulation screen. So that defines them as a thrombotic microangiopathy. And thrombotic microangiopathy, also known as a TMA. And really we're dealing with hemolytic uremic syndrome. Always have abnormal renal function, quite bad with the hemolysis and the low platelets, that trio. And what changes with TTP is the platelet count tends to be really low. We will have neurological signs and quite often a fever. So that's a, a pentad hemolysis, low platelets, uh, maybe abnormal renal function, neurological signs uh, and a fever. Now, HUS, we divide into diarrhea-associated, you know all this, E. coli, Shigella, they produce a toxin, or it's atypical, and the atypical ones tend to have uh, an underlying complement problem. In the UK, we send them all off uh, for complement typing. And then there's a host of other things that can cause this picture, quite a lot of drugs, um, and uh, HIV uh, used to be quite the common cause, uh, but it seems to have settled down recently with the antiretrovirals. So the diagnostic pathway, uh, it was a, a group of intensivists from here uh, and myself, it's very simple. We've got the signs and symptoms you're going to confirm with laboratory tests, you've got renal dysfunction, maybe you might be doing a headstand, but you want to do a sample of feces to look for the toxin. And then you want to measure ADAMITS 13 levels as soon as possible. And if I spoke to you five years ago, nobody would have ready access to the assay. Nowadays, everyone should be able to get back in Adam at 13 within 24 hours. Is there anyone here who can't do that? Okay, that's good. Because we're going to talk about Adam at 13 and TTP in a second, but it's a reminder to me to talk about the Von Willebrand factor. Really simple stuff. This uh, so. Von Willebrand factor is held in little bundles called Weibel palade bodies in the endothelium. Uh, and on the left, it's from my days of being a, a transplanter. We have um, used immuno uh, markers to show up the Von Willebrand factor within the heart endothelium. You can see how much it lights up. So all the endothelium's stuffed with um, von Willebrand factor. And then on the right, we've got a electron micrograph of a Weibel palade body. You can see it's stuffed with big molecules. It will come to the surface and kneel with the surface and open up and discharge uh, with stimuli such as histamine or adrenaline. When you go for a run, your von Willebrand factor level will go up because you're discharging from your Weibel palade uh, bodies. And then as it opens up, the inner membrane of the Weibel palade body is actually coated 
with tissue plasminogen activator too. So you switch on fibrinolysis uh, at the same time. So the von Willebrand factor is made in the endothelial cell and it's made up of monomers like a stack of plates. And when the uh, endothelial cell secretes the von Willebrand factor, it's an enormous stack, really huge stack. What we've got at the top is a little cartoon of a normal size von Willebrand factor showing what it does. So it will bind to certain receptors on the platelets, glycoprotein 1b is its favourite, and it'll also bind to collagen when the endothelium has been damaged and you've exposed the uh, underlying cement. So it is the ligand for platelet adhesion. It is responsible for platelets adhering to damaged surfaces. And that makes it really, really important. So if you don't have von Willebrand factor, you will bleed for a little bit longer. Uh, and then you can see sitting on its side, there's a little molecule and that's factor eight. The factor eight is carried by von Willebrand factor. Without that, the factor eight uh, would be weed out and you'd have low levels. And so if you've got von Willebrand's disease, you've also got low levels of factor eight. So when we look at um, von Willebrand factor in critical care, surprisingly, a von Willebrand's disease is very common in Europe. It's co commonest in Scandinavia. It decreases down across Europe. And many families don't realize they have von Willebrand's disease because it's autosomal dominant, so they have many other members. Uh, and for the women, they may all bruise easily. A girl might start her periods and say to her mother, I'm bleeding a lot. And you, her mother will talk to her and say, no, that's the same as mine. And so they may not just present. And in fact, the eldest patient I've ever diagnosed with von Willebrand's disease was somebody who kept oozing and oozing and oozing after a cholecystectomy at the age of 95. And <laughs> She had von Willebrand's disease and she'd just gone through life uh, and it never got picked up. And talking to the rest of her family, I think one of her children had it too. So rarely you can get antibodies to uh, von Willebrand factor, very, very rarely. But much more commonly, we have a problem that we can have breakdown of the von Willebrand factor form. So that stack of plates might get broken down to smaller ones and we lose the high molecular weight ones and it's the high molecular weight ones that do the business that will do the adhesion to the platelet uh, and the damaged wall uh, and so we see that in ECMO patients they have an acquired von Willebrand's disease because they're breaking up the von Willebrand molecules as they pass through the circuit uh, and uh, we also see it in aortic stenosis, really tight stenosis, von Willebrand factor will break up. Uh, and it can also lead to GI bleeding because we have discovered that von Willebrand factor is really important in regulating vascular growth. So low levels of von Willebrand factor will lead to overgrowth of uh, vascular tissue in the bowel, you get angiodysplasia of the bowel, uh, and that's known as Hades syndrome. So back to Adam at 13. So as we said, we get extremely large molecules of von Willebrand factor being pushed out of the endothelium. And Adam at 13 is the enzyme that will break down those very large forms to just high molecular weight uh, von Willebrand factor. And in the absence of Adam Adamitz 13, either congenital or there's an antibody to the molecule, which is acquired TTP, we will get the formation of these really, really large von Willebrand factor molecules. And they're super good at activating platelets uh, and they'll just do it at a drop at a hat of a hat uh, 
uh, in high shear pressure areas. So that's what happens uh, in TTP. Uh, so we're moving on now and we've got to move into an area where you've got normal platelet counts and abnormal coagulation. And my message to you is hand it over to the haemophilia team. Because if you've got an isolated coagulation, uh, and, um, uh, isolated deficiency of a coagulation factor, they're the best people to deal with it. Um, they have all the experience. They've got a huge number of patients with inherited problems with it. Uh, and they have access to all the products and the know-how in how to use them. So for me, it's just a phone call to the haemophilia team to get them to manage the patient. So this is a patient who's got um, an acquired haemophilia A because they have got an antibody to factor eight. It can happen in old people. It can happen in people who've got uh, immune dysregulation, autoimmune disease. And uh, there are a number of ways that you can deal with that. So uh, you probably give a bit of a bypassing product and the whole world is changing in haemophilia. The most exciting one is emicizumab. And that will take over the function of factor VIII. So what it does, it's a bispecific antibody. It grabs hold of factor IX and it grabs hold of factor X. And that's effectively what factor VIII does normally uh, in the coagulation process. So they can have embicizumab. And in fact, we're moving all of our haemophilia A patients over to it instead of having in injections, IV from your mum every second or third day, you can have one subcutaneous injection of emicizumab once a month and it will work over the next month and limit your bleeding. So this is a fantastic revolution in care. And, and we have another area of care in haemophilia, which is gene therapy, but it's quite hard work and no one has found sustained production of factor eight or factor nine beyond a couple of years. So emicizumab is a real blessing to those with haemophilia A. So now we're moving on to those who've got both platelet and coagulation deficiencies. So maybe a platelet count of 50, prolonged PT, prolonged APTT uh, and they've got bleeding. So we know that probably the commonest cause is someone with a disseminated intravascular coagulation, but we can get the same picture if someone is also bleeding out. And before we hit those two areas, uh, we need to think about liver failure. Now, liver failure is uh, a situation where, because the liver produces all the coagulation factors, because it produces all the physiological anticoagulants, you're going to get a reduction in the levels of both of those types of protein. But it's a balanced reduction. So the average patient before a liver transplant will have about 30% levels of all the coagulation factors, but also 30% levels of all the physiological anticoagulants. So they just reset, they just reset. It's very balanced and they don't tend to bleed unless you make a hole in them. And then they will bleed because they've got poor hemostatic reserve. Because there's just less there um, uh, to actually clot. Uh, the other issues uh, with the liver is it's producing thrombopoietin. So we will have reduced production of thrombopoietin. So that's partly responsible for the low platelet count. Um, we don't get removal of salicylic acid, which tends to cover all of the clotting proteins so they can't work so well. 
and not so good at getting rid of some of the fibrinolytic activators. So we have a tendency for increased fibrinolysis. But what we don't have, and which isn't on this, because this is from 2014, and since that time, we know that if we look at thrombin generation, if we look at how well someone with liver disease can make a clot, they can make it just as well as somebody who hasn't got liver disease. So the potential is all there. So these patients should not be assumed to have high risk of bleeding. They actually have quite high rates of thrombosis, and we should be using thromboprophylaxis in them uh, if they're at risk whilst they're in, ho in hospital. Um, at the bottom, we've got something which harks back to the chat about anemia. We've got someone who's got renal failure, so we've lost axial flow in our, uh, our renal failure. And the other issue is that we've got some platelet dysfunction as well, although nobody really understands it. It's not quite so bad uh, as people say. So I haven't got much longer. Just a quick flick through the DIC slides. So I think the important thing, and this is a horror, this slide, sorry, is to remind you that if you have liver failure, you'll get exactly the same changes when you do standard testing as you would in DIC, which is why I say you have to go and see the patient and talk to uh, the rel I have to talk to the staff looking after them. So we've got prolonged PT, prolonged APTT, high D-dimers, prolonged bleeding time, low platelet count. And then right at the bottom, we've got hyperfibrinolysis, which isn't often talked about. So hyperfibrinolysis will tend to look the same as all of uh, the DICs and the liver failure, but they tend to have really, really high levels of D-dimer and low levels of fibrinogen. So what do we mean by hyperfibrinolysis? We mean increased production of fibrinolytic activators uh, such that we are losing integrity of clots. We've got such high amounts of um, fibrinolytic activators that you can form a clot and uh, that gets broken down almost as quickly as it's forming. Uh, and it has to be looked out for, and it can present in all sorts of strange ways. The last one I saw was a 30-year-old man. He had a bleeding tongue, and it just wouldn't stop bleeding. And then you do the coagulation screen, and he's got this prolongation of the PT, APTT, really low fibrinogen, and really high D-dimers. And to cut a very long story short, he had a fibrinolytic problem because he had metastatic disease, uh, which had not been previously diagnosed. And uh, classically, some metastases can cause uh, marked fibrinolytic problems. I'm going to have to stop there. I think I've covered most of it, really. Uh, and just say thank you very much for listening. I hope I've inspired you a little bit to see that coagulation is really interesting and fun too. Thank you. Thank you.